Thank you so much, ladies. Do you have CDs available tonight after the meetings? No? No, we got to think about that. All right, well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the grand finale to part three of American Crisis. I hope you have uh, been inspired and blessed so far. Hope you had a good meal. A good, as the pastor said, it wasn't actually a light supper, but it was a great supper. And hopefully everybody will stay awake. Sometimes after you eat a meal and then sit, uh, sometimes the blood goes from the head to the stomach and people could maybe doze off. And if you do doze off, let me give you a fair warning. Uh, and that is that I've been known to use sleeping people as sermon illustrations. So hopefully that'll keep you awake. All right, well, let me uh, go through just a few announcements before we uh, get into this, this big topic. Uh, one of the things I like to do at the end of this meeting, <clears throat> thank you very much, <clears throat> is to pass out a card. We have a little card here that the ushers will be giving you at the end, and this is called My Decision for Jesus. And I do this because I believe that God wants us to make decisions after we learn Bible truth. He wants us to make decisions to be on Jesus' side. And so just to give you a heads up that this is coming now, no force, nobody has to fill it out. I believe in free will, as I think you've learned by now, uh, freedom. But anyway, uh, this is just something that I believe uh, is good for us to make decisions to follow Jesus. So that will be coming. Uh, a couple of other things that I like to do at the end of my last meeting is to just tell you a couple of a couple of things that are unrelated. Since this, this is my last uh, time, uh, just let you know that our ministry, which is called Whitehorse Media, based in Idaho, North Idaho, that we have put together a fantastic online free Bible school. And so there's no charge. And when these are all over, if you have an interest to go on to whitehorsemediabibleschool.com, uh, we have a whole series of videos, 26 half hour videos filmed in Israel uh, that walk you through Bible teaching, including end time Bible teaching. So this is just a fabulous resource. There's no cost and it's all based on the Bible. And so if you have an interest, you can check that out. Uh, another website that uh, a friend of mine has put together in partnership with myself is a health website. Uh, I, I wear many hats. I have my father hat, my husband hat. I'm the husband to my wife, Kristen, and then my kids. And I have my ministry hat. And I also have a health hat so I can uh, be as healthy as I can. I'm a big gardener, as I mentioned earlier. And not only am I a gardener, but I like to grow what's called sprouts and microgreens which are super healthy, uh, especially during the winter months when, now at least in Idaho, the snow comes down. I don't imagine, do you get snow here in Wichita? I don't think so. You do you? Get some snow here? I forgot, it's been 30 years since I used to live here. I hardly even remember. But anyway, so when winter comes and you can't grow a garden, uh, this is a fabulous thing to do, is to grow sprouts and microgreens in your home for pennies a day. I've learned how to do this. I've been doing this for over 40 years. And so uh, you, there you can see Seth and Abby eating some sunflower greens over there on the left. There's pea microgreens, there's buckwheat, wheatgrass, uh, purple rambo radish. And so my, I have a, an online course where I teach people how to do this. Uh, it's, it's very inexpensive, there's a cost, but it's not much. And so if you have an interest in, in health, building up your health, eating fresh, live, non-GMO organic salads every day, uh, you can check out sproutingwithsteve.com. That's our uh, health site. If you have an interest in checking that out and watching a video there and seeing what it's about. Now, I also have one more uh, new course that I've spent a lot of time in, a lot of research. Uh, I really believe in it. And it's called, it's a course called Grow Your Money with God. Uh, we all know that we all have bills to pay, something we can't avoid. And uh, money is very much a part of the battle between good and evil. Uh, the Bible talks about how the love of money is very dangerous, and yet it also tells us to give to God's work, uh, our tithes, our offerings. And so we have a whole course that I put together 
called Grow Your Money with God. It's the only course that I'm aware of uh, anywhere in the world that combines uh, Warren Buffett and John Bogle, who founded Vanguard, uh, with the Bible. Buffett, Bogle, and the Bible. It talks about the importance of getting out of debt, uh, how to get out of debt, how to be responsible financially, and it also deals with the whole issue of after we've given uh, our tithes and our offerings and been faithful to God, uh, should we take a portion of our money and should we invest it for our futures? And if we do, how do we do that? What do we do? Uh, what's a responsible way to do that so that we're not throwing our money away and we're not gambling, but we are responsibly preparing for our futures while we are here in this world as we are waiting for Jesus to come. Uh, Jesus did say, occupy until I come. So anyway, if you have an interest, you can check out the website. Uh, there's a section on the top called education where there's a lot of free, uh, free sermons and talks and information that you can uh, listen to. And then there is a cost for the course if you have an interest, but it's very reasonable. And uh, I'm a big believer in being responsible with our finances. So if you have an interest, check out growyourmoneywithgod.com. Uh, it's a fantastic site. All right, now for our last meeting on America in Crisis, uh, this is the big meeting. This is really the grand finale. Uh, sometimes I tell people that when we get to this topic, you're going to need to put on 10 seatbelts. Lots of seatbelts, because if you were shocked by studying the first beast of Revelation 13, that was an eye opener. And if the second meeting on the beast from the earth was an eye opener, uh, I tell you, this third one is, it's just, I, I don't know what to say. The word is wow. I mean, it's big. Now, I want you to know that this is going to be a very controversial topic, uh, especially if you've never heard this before. I'm going to be sharing some new information. And what I uh, like to request of my audience, as I've done this many, many times, is to hear me out and to check it out and to test it by the Bible. Does that sound like a fair request? Uh, and, and I also want you to know that, uh, as, as I mentioned on Friday night when I talked about the beast, that I don't believe it's talking about individual people per se, it's talking about a system. And now we're going to get really practical in this third meeting, and we're going to deal with something that may step on some people's toes, as they say. Uh, and I want you to know it's nothing personal, that's for sure. Uh, my commitment is to God and to the Bible and to shoot straight and to tell the truth, no matter what happens, though the heavens fall. That's my commitment to the Lord. And so get ready mentally for some shocking information. And again, all I ask is that you just have an open mind and study it out from the Bible yourself and see if it's right from the word. And I think that is a very, very uh, fair request. Now, when we're done, as I mentioned, we'll uh, pass out the cards and give you a chance to respond to what you've learned. There's also a place on the back you can put prayer requests. Uh, I'm also going to ask the pastor to come up at the very end and let people know what's coming after I leave. And I'm sorry to tell you that even though you voted for me to stay, I'm not staying. <laughs> I'm not. I have a wife and a daughter that is waiting for me to come home, and uh, that's just the way it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just not going to. Uh, I tell people my commitment, number one is to God, number two is to my family, and number three is to, is to the ministry. And so that's my priority, and uh, I miss my daughter and I miss my wife. My son is in college, but he'll be back in just a few weeks when school is over. Looking forward to having him home. And so anyway, when I leave, uh, the pastor will mention that if you have an interest in further studies on the book of uh, a book of Daniel, he's going to make those available to you uh, and give you information about that. And then we're also going to have our table we have in the back when we're all done in the lobby back there. We'll uh, take the cloth off the table. We have uh, quite a bit of material there from Whitehorse Media. Uh, some of it's free. We have a little card about the sprouting course, about the finance course. We have about the uh, Bible school, we have other material that's free, and we have some uh, inexpensive books and some DVDs that are also inexpensive, but there's a lot of resources out there 
uh, from Whitehorse Media if you, if you are interested in checking that out. And then when everything's done, we're going to have a Q&A. So if you have questions about last night or earlier today or this meeting, uh, I'm happy to spend some time and just, you know, have you raise your hand. We'll have a microphone that'll go around and you can just fire away, ask me whatever question you want. Uh, this is not scripted, so I'll do the best that I can. Uh, sometimes Q&As don't last very long because hardly anybody has any questions. And other times they can go on for a while because people have a lot of questions. So I've got nothing else to do tonight. So when we're done, we'll have the Q&A and I'll be happy to take your questions. So let us, let us pray again as we get into our final meeting, grand finale. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love and your goodness to us and your grace, the grace of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our King, our Lord. Thank you for giving us the Bible. Thank you for this wonderful group that has come together meeting after meeting and for the music we've had. And we pray for, again, for the Holy Spirit of God to be here and to speak to our minds and speak to our hearts. Uh, give us all discernment about what's right and what's wrong. Please help me to honor you, to be faithful to you, to be a true teacher of your word. And we just pray that you will help us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, are you ready? Got your seatbelts on? Okay, uh, this meeting is called When No Man Can Buy or Sell, and we are going to the end of Revelation chapter 13. This is the chapter that I've studied. I, I think I know every verse by heart. I could probably close my eyes and go from top to bottom, 18 verses. I have read them over and over and over again. I've studied them carefully. I've prayed over them, and I'm continuing to learn. We can never know everything, right? We all have new things to learn, and that includes me. So now we are down at the end of the chapter, and we're going to look at verse, uh, start with verse 16. Revelation 13, verse 16. And the Bible says that he causes, that means force is going to be used in the future. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And actually the last verse says, here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding, let him count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six, which comes out to six six six. And I have a book that'll be on the table, all about six hundred and sixty six. A lot of information in the Bible and in history about this number. But at this point tonight, we're going to really zero in on verse uh, sixteen and seventeen about the mark of the beast. And the Bible is very clear in this verse. That one of these days, whatever this mark of the beast is, it is going to be enforced by law around the world. And that hasn't happened yet. It is coming. And we want to try to understand this, what this is about. Uh, if you were to go onto the internet, and if you were to, and I guess these days you could probably ask uh, chat G GTP. Uh, or you can just go on Google and you could say, what is the mark of the beast? Uh, I did this on Google some time ago. I typed in, what is the mark of the beast? To see what the internet had to say. And it, take a wild guess how many hits or results came up on my computer screen. <laughs> no, no, no. It wasn't 666 and it wasn't a million. Uh, it was, I'll just tell you. It was 168 million results. 
Yeah, wow, 168 million results. Uh, so that's a lot. And that means that there's 168 million places out there online somewhere where the mark of the beast is referred to. So it's a, it's a big subject. Now, if you were to take the time, which of course nobody has time to do, to look up all those 168 million results, which I don't recommend, I've never done that, uh, I think it's pretty safe to say that you would get different opinions, right? They're not, they don't all say the same thing. Uh, some say one thing, some say something else, some say something else on top of that. Uh, there's just a lot of different views. And they can't all be right, obviously. Now, I don't believe personally that God, that God wants us to primarily do theology by Google or by AI. Uh, ultimately, he wants us to do our theology by what book? By the Bible. That's right. A lot of different opinions on a lot of different subjects that are out there. But if we want to know really what's right or what's wrong and what the truth is, we have to make this book our primary source of information. I believe uh, more in heavenly intelligence than artificial intelligence. We need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Now, the mark of the beast, as you can see here on the screen, is definitely a Bible subject, right? It's in the Word of God. It's in the book of Revelation. It's at the end of Revelation 13. We read about the first beast from the water, second beast from the earth, and at the end of this chapter, both beasts become involved in the enforcing of the mark of the beast. Uh, I've done a lot of study on this topic, and I've discovered that the mark of the beast is mentioned eight times in the book of Revelation. Eight times. And you can look them up one by one. And here's two of them. Here it says people will receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Uh, and then it says nobody can buy or sell, save he that had the mark. So here's the first reference. Here's the second reference. And there are six other references in the book of Revelation to the mark of the beast. Now, uh, most of those references, when you read them, and they really don't tell you exactly what the mark of the beast is. They just describe what's going to happen in connection with the mark, like these verses. They don't really tell you what the mark is, they just say the time is coming when it's going to be enforced uh, in the forehead or in the hand and that nobody can buy or sell unless he has the mark. Now, my, uh, what, what shall I say, my uh, methodology, my strategy of trying to understand prophecy is what I call the clue method, putting together the clues. And we did that last night. We looked at the first beast. And we looked at all these different clues, right? These facts from Revelation 13 and from Daniel 7. And once we put together the biblical pieces of information, we were able to properly identify who that beast is. And the same thing earlier today, we looked at the second beast. And we looked at the clues. We looked at the facts. We looked at the, the puzzle pieces, the details that are in Revelation 13 verse 11 to try to put the pieces together so then we can see the picture of who the second beast is. And we're going to follow the same method when it comes to the mark of the beast. We're going to look at the clues. We're going to look at the puzzle pieces that are in the Bible. And, when, and I believe just like uh, last night when we put together all the clues, we were able to know who the first beast is. And earlier today, we looked at the puzzle pieces from Revelation 13, verse 11, and we were able to identify the second beast. And I, my conviction is that when we put together all the clues about the mark of the beast in the book of Revelation, then guess what? We will be able to know exactly what the mark of the beast 
issue is all about. It's going to be very, very clear. Now, as I've studied all these different uh, verses in, in Revelation, I've also discovered that there is one section in the book of Revelation, one primary section that gives us the most clues. And it really helps us when we put those pieces together, then the issue becomes very, very clear. And that section is in Revelation chapter 14. So if you just turn the page from chapter 13 to chapter 14, and we are going to especially look at verses 6 to 12. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 12. When you read those verses, these verses describe messages that are sent to the world by God that are represented as coming from three angels. Three angels' messages. There's uh, an angel that gives a message in verses 6 and 7. That's the first angel's message. And then in verse uh, 8, Revelation 14, 8, there's another angel who gives a message. And then in verses 9 to 12, there it says in verse 9 that the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice. So the third angel then gives a message. And the third angel's message especially is the message that talks about the mark of the beast, about the beast and the image and the mark and the importance of avoiding that mark. So there's three angels. And these messages, when you read them, and we'll read them in a minute, uh, they are uh, given with loud voices and they are given to people all over the world, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And when these messages are done, when they are finished, if you look at verse uh, 14, verse 14 tells us what happens at the end of the proclamation of the three angels. Verse 14 says, I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like the son of man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. Now who's that? It's Jesus. Jesus is referred to many times. He referred to himself as the Son of Man. And so here John saw the Son of Man coming back because Jesus became a human. He became a son of humanity as a human being born in Bethlehem. And in this picture, he is coming, uh, and on his head is a golden crown. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he has a sickle representing him coming to reap the harvest of the earth. Uh, verse 15 says, another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time is come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. It's harvest time, finally. And he that sat upon the cloud thrust in his sickle upon the earth, and the earth was harvested. So there's a powerful description of the return of Jesus. So uh, my point is that in Revelation 14, we have three angels that give messages to the people of the earth. And then when they're done, what happens? Jesus returns. Jesus comes back. So you have three angels and then the return of Jesus Christ. And that's what the text says. Very, very important. Uh, so the three angels' messages really represent God's last warning to the world before Jesus returns. And uh, doesn't it make sense that before God does something big and before the world is about to experience something big, that God would tell us about it? It does make sense. Uh, he did that in the days of Noah. If you look at Bible history, all throughout Bible history, before something big happens, God says something about it. If you go back to the days of Noah, the world was very uh, wicked. It says in Genesis chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8, that God looked upon the earth and it was full of violence. And every uh, imagination of, of man's hearts was only evil all the time. 
And the Lord looked at the world and he was sorry that he made man because it was so bad. And he decided the limits of my patience are coming. I'm a very patient God. I'm a very patient creator, but I have my limits. And the world was so bad that God decided that, that he was going to ultimately put an end to the wickedness. But before he did that, he raised up a man. And what was his name? He raised up Noah, right. And he told Noah to build a boat. And he gave Noah a message to tell the world what was about to happen. So he didn't just send the flood. He gave a message to let people know that the flood was coming. And, if you, and I, something very important that I've discovered is that God told Noah to build a boat. And does anybody remember how many floors that boat had? How many stories? It had three. It had a lower deck, it had a middle deck, and it had an upper deck. It was a three-story boat. So before God sent the flood to drown the, the lost people, he raised up a man and he told him to build a three-story boat and he appealed through Noah to the people to come in to the three-story boat so they could be protected when the water came down. Pretty significant. A man with a message about a three-story boat before the water came and drowned the world. Now, unfortunately, how many people decided to get into the boat? Only eight. That's right, only eight people. The rest of them thought it'll never happen. There won't be a flood. Uh, God would never do that. And they all drowned. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39, he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be the coming of the Son of Man. So there's a parallel between Noah's day and the final day. Uh, before God destroyed Nineveh, he raised up a man, Jonah, and gave him a message. Before Jesus began his public ministry, when he came the first time, God raised up a man named John the Baptist to prepare the way for the first coming of Christ. And doesn't it make sense that before Jesus comes back again, I mean, what could be more important than the return of Jesus Christ and helping the world to get ready for that event and for the final issues, including the mark of the beast? Uh, it just makes perfect sense that God would once again send messages to the world to help people to understand what the issues are so they can be on his side and they can be ready for, for Jesus Christ's return. That's what the three angels' messages are all about. Uh, there are many of us that really love these messages. We've studied these messages. In fact, there's even some churches in this world called Three Angels Churches. And this happens to be one of them. Now you know why this church is called the Three Angels Church. It's because of Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 12. I remember years ago when I first became a Christian, as I began studying the Bible, eventually I got to the three angels in Revelation 14. And as I was reading these messages, I tell you, the Holy Spirit just, just made a move on me. And he spoke to my mind, he spoke to my heart, and he said, Steve, he basically said to me, Steve Wahlberg, I've called you out of Hollywood, I've called you out of drugs, out of alcohol, out of the wildlife, I've called you to give your life to Jesus, your life to me, to become my, my child, my servant, uh, to, to be an influence on others for good. And as I read Revelation 14, the conviction came to me, Steve, I'm also calling you to be part of sharing the three angels' messages. And I remember thinking about that. I was at my dad's house in Studio City, and I was uh, maybe 21 years old, and I was tossing and turning and thinking about this. Oh, my Lord, you're calling me, Steve Wahlberg, to be part of giving the three angels messages? And I just thought, I don't know if I can, if I can do this. And uh, God just kept speaking to me. I'm calling you. I'm calling you. I'm calling you. And so finally I said, okay, Lord, I'll do it. Uh, if you, but there's a condition. And the condition is that you'll help me 
that you'll open the doors and you will lead me uh, in, in this work. And that was 41 or two or three years ago, many years ago. And since that time, God has opened up door after door after door after door. Uh, he's, he's helped me to be part of a whole team of people called White Horse Media in North Idaho. And he has led me to give seminars uh, in countries, other countries, and in cities around America. And I've gone point by point by point through the three angels' messages. And God has blessed me in doing this. He's blessed my family. He's blessed my children. And I'm just convinced that the three angels are the power message. They're the power message for the world. And you, you might consider this uh, three angels uh, 101. If you've never really studied these messages before, consider this an introduction. And as we go through this, I think you're going to sense the power of these messages. So let's go to verses 6 and 7. And let's just quickly go through angel 1. Verse 6 says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell upon the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So how widespread is this message? It's all over the world. It's worldwide. And uh, this is the first angel's message. Now, the word angel in the Greek, uh, actually, the Greek word is angelos, which means messenger. This is a messenger. And it's the same Greek word that applies in the New Testament to John the Baptist. Uh, in Mark chapter 1, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger before your face, who will prepare the way before you. And that messenger was John, John the Baptist. And the Greek word is angelos, which means messenger. So this doesn't mean that there's going to be a, a literal angel flying around in, in the sky any more than there's going to be a literal seven-headed, ten-horned beast that's going to come out of the water. These are symbols. And the angel is a, is, is a messenger, and it represents people who give these messages, who read them, understand them, get behind them, and share them. And we know this is the fact because the first thing the angel has here is the everlasting gospel to do what? To preach. And, and who are the people that are called to preach? It's the church. Uh, Jesus said, go to all the world and preach the gospel. He said, uh, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. So this angel represents God's people who are preaching, who are giving, and who are sharing this message. And it says here, he has the everlasting gospel. Now, what is the everlasting gospel? The word gospel, what does that mean? It means good news, right? The gospel is the good news. And who is the center of the good news? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus is the center of the gospel. He's the center of the Bible. He's the center of the universe. He needs to be the center of our lives. And so what this is telling us is that before the angel even gives any uh, announcements or makes, or makes any statements, the first thing he has is the everlasting good news about Jesus Christ. And that tells us that Jesus is, the fa is at the foundation of the three angels' messages. Uh, I don't believe that God is ever going to send a message to the world that doesn't have Jesus in the middle of it. I've had people come up to me. Uh, one man in Australia came up to me when I was preaching uh, after my, one of my talks, and he said, Steve Wahlberg, I have a message for you from God. And what do you, how do you respond to that? Someone came up to you and says, I've got a message for you from God. Well, you don't want to just say it's impossible. You can't have a message for me from, from God. Uh, you don't want to just dismiss it. But on the other hand, you don't want to say, okay, whatever you say, I'm going to do it. It must be from the Lord, right? You've got to test it, test it by the Bible to see if it's a message from God. And uh, this is very important that I don't, I don't believe based on by the Bible that God is going to send anybody a, a message in these last days that doesn't have Jesus in the middle of that message. Jesus is, is, if he isn't in the middle of it, it can't be true. And the book of Revelation itself, the first sentence is called 
the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the book of Revelation comes from Jesus. The three angels' messages come from Jesus. And the first angel's message has the everlasting gospel, which is the message of Jesus. So it tells us that, that Jesus is at the foundation of these messages. And that's very, very important to understand that Christ needs to be the center of everything that we do. So this is a message flying in the middle of heaven, representing center stage. He's flying fast. He has the gospel to preach to people that dwell upon the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. In other words, these messages are worldwide. They're global. They're not just to be done in a corner. And then in verse 7, the first angel says, with what kind of a voice? A loud voice. And you just get the impression that God is trying to get our attention. He gives this message with a loud voice. And what does he say with a loud voice? The angel says, fear God. And let me just ask you, how important is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is anything more important than that? No. So uh, we're dealing with big issues here. How about fearing God, reverencing God, putting God first in your life? How important of a message is that? Do you think the world needs that message? That we all need to fear God and put God first? And then it says, and give glory to him. Uh, sin started with, a, with an angel who decided he wasn't going to give glory to God. He was going to give glory to himself. And that's how we got into this whole mess. This whole mess started with an angel who decided he no longer wanted to give his maker the glory. So the first angel's message is dealing with deep issues, the gospel, fearing God, and giving him the glory. And then it says, for the hour of his judgment is come. We're in a judgment time. We're in a time when people need to make decisions. Whose side are they on? Are they on the side of God or the side of the rebel angel? Are they on the side of, of the devil? Uh, and that's a very important message that we are living in a judgment time. And then it says, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. How important would you say it is for human beings around the world to worship God as their maker? Is that a minor message or is that an important message? It's important. How important is it? I don't think we can put a, a, a degree on it. Uh, we know from looking around the world that a lot of people today believe in evolution. They believe we came from monkeys or mollusks or some primal soup from the goop. Eventually it got to you, but the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that we just got here by chance, that we just evolved. The Bible teaches that we were uh, carefully crafted and meticulously created by a master designer who is God himself, that God made the heavens, he made the earth, he made the sea, he made you, he made me. When you look in the mirror and look at yourself, uh, even though we're fallen and we're getting old, uh, you are still looking at a masterpiece of creation. You know, all the artificial intelligence and all the sophisticated NASA uh, telescopes, there's nothing on this planet that compares with the sophistication of your brain and your eyes and your ears and your organs and the system that works together so amazingly so that you can breathe and you can see and you can hear and you can feel and you can uh, love. And there's, there's just nothing like it. Uh, I am not an advocate of evolution. I do not believe in the Big Bang unless we interpret that to mean in the beginning of the world, God spoke and bang, the, the world appeared. That's my version of the Big Bang. To me, it's just, it doesn't make sense that all of this complexity and intricate details uh, that human beings and the brain and children and 
trees and flowers and, and the stars and the sun and the moon, uh, that all of this just got here by chance. Just mindless chance. It just doesn't make sense. And the first angel's message is an appeal to the world to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, to put God first in your life, to realize we're in a judgment time where we have to make choices, and then to worship the one who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and, and everything in it. How important is that? I mean, there's, you can't hardly imagine anything more important than that. So that is angel one. First angel's message, and I didn't write the whole angel's message, just a, a number of the points here. We've got the gospel and the importance of worshiping our maker. So that's angel number one. Now, angel number two, and I don't have time to go into all the details about this, but I would encourage you to study this. Uh, angel two says, it says there followed another angel. And he said, Babylon is fallen. The word Babylon goes back to the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, where God confused the languages and they were babbling and they couldn't understand each other. And Babylon essentially means confusion. And it's also talking about especially religious confusion. Now, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. And she's also represented in Revelation 17 as a woman. And a woman in the Bible is a church. So this is really a fallen woman, a fallen church. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made how many nations? It says all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And her fornication means her involvement with kings. She's uh, fornicating with the kings of the earth, it says in Revelation 17. And this tells us also that Babylon is uh, making the whole world drunk with her wine. And her wine is her false teachings. So the first angel goes out to the whole world. And then the second angel says, Babylon has fallen and, the, and all the nations have been drinking of her wine. So the first angel basically says, this is the truth that God wants us to know. And then the second angel says, watch out for Babylon, which is leading people astray from the truth that God wants us to know. That's what the second angel is all about, all of Babylon. And then the third angel comes along in verses 9 to 12. Verse 9 says, and the third angel followed them. So that's how we know there's three of them. We have the first one, the second one, and then it says, the third one comes. The third angel followed them, and, and he said, with what kind of a voice? with a loud voice. So these are, you just get the impression God's really trying to get our attention. He's really speaking to us. He really wants people to understand certain things. And what does he say with a loud voice? He says, if any man, which applies to anybody in the world, if any man worships who? The beast, which is the first beast of chapter 13, and his image which is set up by the second beast, when the second beast finally starts looking like the first beast. That's the image of the beast. And then it says, and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, which means no mixture of mercy into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, who is Jesus. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest. Notice that, no rest. Day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. So here's the warning about the mark, and that's what we're studying tonight the mark of the beast and this is uh, this is i think you can read from genesis to revelation and you'll never find a more solemn warning than the third angel i mean it's very the language is very fiery 
And I don't believe this is because God is bad or mean or cruel, but it's because he really wants to get our attention because he does not want us to follow the beast or the image, and he does not want us to get the mark. So he's in great earnestness, earnestness with us. That's why he gives us this, uh, this strong message. And then verse 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Now the saints are those that are not on the side of the beast. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they, and what do they do? Right here are they that keep the commandments of God, and they also have, it says, the faith of Jesus. So we have three angels. The third angel warns about the, about the mark, and then the third angel concludes with people who don't get the mark. Here are they, it says, that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, if you look at the very last, the third angel concludes with verse 12. And what is the last word before the period at the end of the third angel? What's the word before the period? It's Jesus, right? And the first angel has the gospel, which is the gospel of Jesus. And in the middle of the third angel, it talks about in verse 10, at the end of verse 10, it talks about the lamb who is Jesus. And at the end of the third angel, it says, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So as I have pondered this, I've discovered that the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's three angels' messages which come from Jesus before Jesus returns. And the first angel has the gospel. The third angel talks about the lamb. And at the end of the third angel, there's the word Jesus, the name Jesus before the period, and then Jesus returns. So Jesus is at the beginning. He's at the, in the middle. He's at the end. He's uh, the alpha and the omega. He's the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end. He's everything. Some people say, well, I don't need the three angels' messages. All I need is Jesus. And I believe all we do need is Jesus. But if we really want to follow the Jesus of the Bible, then we're going to listen to the three angels' messages because those are, those are his messages. And he is in the middle of these messages. So uh, when you look at this whole picture here, we've got angel one. Angel two is not mentioned. There. I just didn't have space. We've got uh, some of, of angel three. Then we have the conclusion, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And then we have the return of Jesus in the clouds. Do you see that? Is this clear? Is this really what the Bible is, is showing us? Is this a, a biblical revelation? It, it is. It's very, very clear. Now, here's uh, let's start putting together the, the, the clues, the, uh, the puzzle pieces. Uh, first thing I want to make very clear for the record want to make this real clear, and that is that uh, no Christian or no human is saved by keeping the commandments of God. I'm very clear on that. The New Testament is very clear that we are saved not by the works of the law, but by our faith in Jesus, right? Commandment keeping does not save anybody. But I'm also clear on the fact that when we, the law shows us that we're sinners, shows us that we need a savior, we've broken the first commandment, we've committed adultery, we've stolen, we've lied, we've had idols, whatever commandments we've broken. And that's really the reason why Jesus died. Why did Jesus die on the cross in the first place? The reason why he died is because we sinned, because we've broken God's commandments. We haven't done his will. And because of that, that's the reason why Jesus died. And how am I going to get to heaven? I talked about this last night. I'm going to get to heaven, not by my works, not by my commandment keeping, but my, by my faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm real clear on that for sure. But now another question is, once I accept Jesus as my savior, once I realize that I'm a sinner and I come to Jesus and I kneel at the foot of the cross and I say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I have no hope but you. You are my only hope. I trust in you and in your grace. Uh, and then it, when he receives me and uh, forgives me and comes into my life, does that mean that, that it, then it's okay for me to go around 
uh, breaking all of the commandments. Is it okay for me to lie, for me to steal, for me to commit adultery, be unfaithful with my wife, uh, bow down to idols? Would anybody think that because we're saved by grace that it's okay for Christians to go around breaking the law? No, I, I, I don't believe that, and I don't think you do either. And so what the, what the third angel's message does is it presents a biblical balance that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. But when Jesus has come into our life, God wants us to be commandment keepers. He wants us to live moral lives. He wants us to be different from the world. And this whole topic ties in with the mark of the beast. And I'll show you where, where it is. If you look back at your Bible, if you look at verse 9, or I'm sorry, verse 11, verse 11 says, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. And then it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So what's happening here is verse 11 warns about the mark, and then verse 12 describes the saints who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In other words, if we are on the side of Jesus and on the side of the cross and on the side of keeping the commandments of God, then we will not be on the side of the beast and the image and the mark. He, he draws a line on the one side is the beast, the image, and the mark, and on the other side are the saints who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. He's drawing a line in these, in these verses. Now, uh, here's something else very important about the mark of the beast. More clues. If you look at angel one, notice the word worship. Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea. And then verse 9, angel 3, says, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. So do you see a contrast here? Notice the word worship is used twice. One group worships him that made heaven and earth and the sea, worships the creator. The other group worships the beast and his image and receives his mark. So it's a worship issue. On the one side are the worshipers of the beast and the image and get the mark. On the other side are the worshipers of the maker of heaven and earth. So being a worshiper of our creator is critical to being on the Lord's side when it comes to the mark of the beast. Now, just as I mentioned uh, in the last meeting, that most people have never noticed that something was missing on those two horns. Remember that? That the, there's no crowns on those horns. And that's a very significant detail. Somebody came up to me uh, in between the last meeting and this one, and they said, you know, I never saw that, that there's no crowns on those horns. And that really inspired them to study this. And uh, when you look at, at this verse about the mark of the beast, there's something connected to the mark of the beast that is very, very important that's right there in that verse that most people, they just never see it. It's to, it goes right over their heads. It's the difference between water skiing and deep sea diving. There's a critical truth about the mark of the beast right there in that verse that most people have never even noticed. Uh, and it's, uh, see, here's the way I explain it. H have, have any of you ever, <laughs> I'll, I'll make a little confession here. Have any of you, especially those of you that are wearing glasses, have you ever looked for your glasses and you didn't know where they were, but where were they? <laughs> they were right there. They were either here or even here. You ever had that happen? It's because you're getting old. That's, it's happening to me too. And so, you know, the, uh, the expression is, it's as plain as the nose on your face, but you don't see it. And it's the same thing with this, you know, the glasses are right there, but people don't see them. And it's the same thing with the mark of the beast. 
there's something that's right there, right in plain sight, that's clear as day, that most people have never even thought of. And I'm going to show it to you right now. I'm going to, you're going to see it. You're, you're going to go, your eyes are going to go, oh, I see it. There it is. Uh, it says, if any man worships the beast and his image and receives, and what's that little three-letter word before the word mark? His mark. Now, why is that important? A lot of people think about the mark of the beast, they, they Google the mark of the beast, they try to figure out the mark of the beast, but they miss something basic and fundamental like the nose on your face. What they miss is that the mark of the beast is the mark of the beast. It's his mark. So in order to know what the mark is, what else do we need to know? Yes, we need to know who the beast is, who the biblical beast is, because the mark of the beast is the mark of the beast. In other words, it's a mark that comes from the beast that is described in the Bible. And that is a very, very important point. Now, who is the biblical beast? beast that we studied about last night that has a mark his mark well uh, those of you that were here last night if you weren't you can get the book that we gave that we gave out for free uh, called the antichrist identified i'm not going to review all of those details but uh, protestant scholars and historians and ministers preachers laymen for hundreds of years after the reformation they believe that the beast was a symbol of the Roman Catholic Church system. That's what the whole Reformation was all about, was to uh, rise up and to bring people back to the Bible and away from the traditions that had come into, uh, into Christianity, the beast of prophecy. And that's what I studied with you last night. Uh, in one of my meetings a number of years ago, somebody gave me a copy of this Bible. This is a, I used to bring it around with me, but now I just took pictures of it because it's heavy, it's big, and I decided not to put it in my luggage. But I've got this Bible in my library. It's an old Bible. And this woman gave it to me. She said it's a family heirloom. heirloom. Our, uh, our great, great uh, daddy John was a lay Presbyterian minister, and this was his Bible. And it has uh, this particular Bible. It's very interesting that it has footnotes in the Bible. And I took another picture of the inside. It's hard for you to see here. And I'll go, I'll give you another picture shortly. But anyway, this particular Bible, when you, when you read in Revelation, other different chapters, there are footnotes. Now, not all footnotes are uh, inspired. Obviously, I don't think any footnotes inspired, is inspired. Some footnotes are good, some are bad. Uh, they can teach you some good things. You have to be careful because they're still from man, but they can be very enlightening. And this particular Bible, which is an old Presbyterian lay preacher's Bible from the 1800s, this particular Bible, when you look at Revelation 13, verse 16, which we looked at earlier, which talks about the mark of the beast, this is what the footnote says. Very interesting. It says that, that the mark has to do with submission to the rites and the ceremonies of the papal communion in their right hand that has to do with active obedience to the papal power or in their foreheads that has to do with outward profession of its doctrines and its infallible authority now my point is that in the footnotes of this old presbyterian protestant bible it simply reflected the common protestant view which used to be held by the baptists and the methodists and the presbyterians and the Lutherans and the Congregationalists uh, until recent years when there's been a big shift in teachings about prophecy. And now people no longer know who the beast is. Now they think the beast is some one person that's going to show up at the end of time after we're gone. But they've lost their whole knowledge of history. They've lost the history of the Baptist denomination. They've lost the history of the Lutherans. 
of Martin Luther and John Wesley, who founded the Methodist Church, and Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher in London. And the list just goes on and on. You look at these men, these men of God, Calvin, the Presbyterian, uh, you look at all their teachings about Bible prophecy and the beast, and they all believed that the beast of prophecy was a symbol of the Roman Catholic Church. That's why they became Protestants. They protested and they left the Church of Rome in the 1500s and beyond that. And this particular Bible simply reflects the old Protestant position that the beast is a symbol of the papal power. And what this uh, Bible does significantly is it connects the mark of the beast with the papal power, just like scripture does. It says the mark is his mark. It's the mark of the beast that is described in the Bible. So if we're going to really go in the right direction to understand what the mark is, we've got to know who the beast is. Doesn't that make sense? It's just, uh, it's just basic. Now, let me go back to our summary slide here. Three angels' messages, God's last message of warning to the world. Angel one has the gospel and tells us to worship the maker of heaven and earth. That's exactly what the Bible says. Uh, Angel two warns about Babylon has fallen and is deceiving the world with her wine. The world is drunk with the wine of Babylon, which means people are confused by the false teachings of Babylon. And then angel three tells us not to worship the beast and the image and not to receive his mark, which is the mark of that first beast in Revelation 13, which describes the papal power. And then the, three, the third angel's message concludes with the punchline. And the punchline is that God is calling us. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Remember we read it about the little horn It says he made war against the saints. And that's what the beast does. He makes war against the saints. The saints are not on the side of the beast. And it tells us what the saints do. They don't get the mark because they keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus. In other words, there they are on uh, the side of the gospel and the creator and they do these things. And that's why they're not over here worshiping the beast and the image and getting the mark. Does that make sense? These are the clues. When you put the puzzle pieces together, the picture becomes very, very clear. Now, here's another critical point before I actually identify uh, what the mark of the beast actually is. When the first angel says, worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea, Specifically in the New Testament, who is him that made heaven and earth and the sea according to the New Testament? That's right. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. It is Jesus himself. Uh, If you're taking notes, you can jot down John chapter 1 verse 10. It's my favorite verse on this that says, he was in the world. And the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And that tells us that it was our maker that became a human and was walking around on planet Earth. It's our maker who gave his life for us on the cross. It's the one who made everything who became a human and walked around and healed and loved and suffered and died. Uh, Ephesians 3 verse 9 says, God created all things by Jesus Christ. Colossians 1 16 says, by him were all things made, things visible, invisible, thrones, dominion, powers, all things were made by him and for him. According to the New Testament, it's as clear as sunlight. Uh, It's really Jesus himself that is the one in cooperation with the father like it says in genesis 1 it says god said let us make man in our image that's the father and the son working together to create the world and jesus was very involved in the creation of this world that's very very clear so when the when the first angel calls us 
to follow the gospel and to worship our creator. As they say, all roads lead to Rome. Scripturally, all real truth leads to Christ. He is the maker of heaven and earth. And the mark of the beast in the final analysis is a mark that comes from the beast that is against the maker of heaven and earth, who is Jesus Christ. It's a mark that is put into people's foreheads and into their hands, which is a mark against Jesus Christ, against the maker of all. We're dealing with a deep, deep spiritual issue here. Now, um, with all of this background, I want to tell you to put all your seatbelts on because I'm going to really, I'm going to get into the specific here and I want you to take a very close look at this. Very close look. The Bible's very clear that we need to worship him that made heaven, earth, and the sea, right? Very clear. It also tells us that we need to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We, put, we have both. Yes, we're saved by grace, but we still want to be commandment keepers. Some people focus on the law and they neglect grace. It's a big mistake. That's what the Pharisees did. They said the law, the law, the law. But they rejected Jesus Christ. Other people say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We want nothing to do with obedience to God. Nothing to do with God's commandments. That's another extreme. And the third angel's message brings them together that we follow Jesus and we keep his commandments because we love him. That's the uh, beauty of the third angel. And the third angel tells us that we need to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, here's, here we go. When you look at the Ten Commandments, and they're in Exodus chapter 20, if you want to open your Bibles to Exodus 20. When you look at the Ten Commandments very carefully, one by one, and by the way, what makes the Ten Commandments different from any other law that's ever been written? It was written with the finger of God. And what was it written on? It was written on solid stone. You ever heard the expression, we can change this or that because it's not written in stone? That goes back to the Ten Commandments. I'm a strong believer in the Ten Commandments, every single one of them. Not that the law of God is going to save me because I'm saved by, the, by Jesus, but the law of God shows me what God's will is for my life his will for all of our lives. And the law of God, the Ten Commandments, is the only thing that we have preserved that was written with the finger of God on stone. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, which the third angel describes, here are they that keep the commandments of God, the faith of Jesus. There is only one commandment. Just like last night, we looked at all the clues about the, the first beast. There's only one beast that fits every detail. It's the Church of Rome. And we looked at the second beast. There's only one nation that fits every detail. It's the United States. We look at Bible prophecy, and there's only one person that fulfilled all these prophecies, and that's Jesus Christ. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, there's only one commandment that specifically and directly talks about him that made heaven and earth and the sea. In those exact words. And that is the very commandment, and I'll show you the quote in just a little bit, that the beast openly says, we changed it, and the change is a mark of our authority. And I'll show you that quote in a minute. And what is that commandment? It is commandment number four. This is the only one that specifically talks about worshiping the maker of heaven and earth. And it's very significant that the first angel, when he says, worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea, this is actually a quote from the fourth commandment, a direct quote. Now look, now go back to Exodus 20 and look at verse, verse eight. Here's the 10 commandments. And this is number four. The fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
Now, with what part of your body do you remember? You remember right here inside your forehead, which is your mind. That's where you remember. And it's the only commandment that God said, remember. There's eight commandments that say, uh, thou shalt not steal or lie or commit adultery or bow down to idols. One commandment says, honor your father and mother. And one commandment says, remember, which means don't forget that one. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. And with what do you work? You work with your hand. So the fourth commandment deals with the forehead and it deals with the hand. And then verse 10 says, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Jews. Is that what it says? No, it doesn't say the seventh day is Sabbath of the Jews. The seventh day is not the Sabbath of the Jews. God did tell the Jews to keep it, but it is not their day. He says the seventh day is the Sabbath of who? Of the Lord, your God. Your God. Now, what day is the seventh day? It's, well, what day did Jesus rise from the dead? Yeah, the first day, right. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all say Jesus rose on the first day of the week. And I believe that. I believe Jesus rose on, on the first day of the week, which was what day? Sunday. Jesus rose on Sunday. Praise God, he rose on Sunday. I believe that with all my heart. But the first day of the week is not the seventh day. The, the first day of the week comes after the seventh day. It's the seventh day that is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. It says, in it you shall not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger. Strangers are non-Jews, uh, anybody, Gentiles, that is within your gates. And then verse 11, here's the punchline. For in six days the Lord made. And who did we read is the Lord who made? It's Jesus. It says uh, in John 1.10, he was in the world and the world was made by him. So this says in six days, the Lord made, and that's the Lord Jesus. He made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and he rested on what day? He rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he hallowed it. So the fourth commandment is very clear that the seventh day is his special day. What day did Jesus keep when he was on earth? He kept the seventh day. It says he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He healed on the Sabbath day. Uh, he told his followers, pray that you will not, that your flight be not in winter or on the Sabbath day. Uh, after he died, it says his followers rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Luke 23, 56. Jesus said that he was Lord even of what day? Even of the Sabbath day. He said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. And then the Pharisees tried to kill him. And they knew that when he said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath, he's essentially saying, I'm God. I'm the maker of heaven and earth. And that's why ultimately they tried to kill him because they considered him to be a blasphemer. But he wasn't a blasphemer because he really is God in human, human form. Uh, here's something very significant. The mark of the beast is mentioned eight times in the book of Revelation, and the first day of the week is mentioned eight times in the New Testament. It's mentioned in the Gospels, it's mentioned once in 1 Corinthians, and once in Acts chapter 20. Eight times. But when you look up all those eight references to the first day of the week in the New Testament, Here's something very important. Not one of those references to the first day of the week was ever spoken directly by the lips of Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus said nothing about the first day of the week at all. Now he rose on the first day of the week. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all say that. On the first day of the week, the angel came down, rolled away the stone, and Jesus rose. But Jesus himself said nothing about it. He never taught about it. He never told people to keep it. He never said he was changing the Sabbath into Sunday. Absolute, total silence. And that's important because at the end of the book of Matthew, 
Jesus told his disciples to go to all the world, preach the gospel, and to teach people to do all things, whatever I've commanded you. Matthew 28, verse 20. And since Jesus never commanded the first day of the week, then the Christian church, the Christian pastors, the Christian leaders have absolutely no zero authority from Jesus himself directly to teach obedience to the first day of the week. It did not come from Christ. And it's not in the Ten Commandments, and it's not the Fourth Commandment. Now, it's no secret that the majority of Christians today do not keep the seventh day. Now, they have switched from the seventh day of the Fourth Commandment to Sunday. Right? And as, as I mentioned earlier, and maybe I should just say this again for the record, I believe that God has people in all churches today that love him and are his people. I truly believe that. Uh, my dad died a Presbyterian, Hollywood Presbyterian, although he kept the Sabbath. He was a Sabbath-keeping Presbyterian. Uh, there are, God has people in all churches around the world who keep Sunday, including in the Catholic Church, who are his people, who love him, who are following the Bible as best they can, who are trusting Jesus for their salvation. And I believe there's going to be people from all churches that are going to be in the kingdom. I do not believe that only Seventh-day Adventists are going to be up there, or Seventh-day Baptists, or Seventh-day Pentecostals. Uh, I believe there's going to be lots of Catholics, lots of Protestants, lots of Lutherans, all kinds of people in many different churches who are following Jesus to the best of their abilities because they're sincere and they've given their lives to Christ. Just like the thief on the cross, he accepted Jesus and Jesus told him that he would be with him uh, in the kingdom. So a lot of people have throughout history been keeping the first day of the week, and I'm not saying that they are lost, that's for sure. But I do believe that as we get closer to the end of time, as we get closer to the final issues, it just makes perfect sense that God would be sending light to his people from his word through the three angels to get them to go back to the Bible, back to the word, back to the Ten Commandments, and to move away from the traditions that have come in to the church. Where did the switch come from anyway? I have a Catholic catechism right here in my hand, and here's a quote from page 50 of this catechism from the Catholic Church. Page 50. Question, what day is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why then do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. They come right out and they say it uh, very, very clearly. And this is one of many places. Now, here's an amazing quote. This is from one of the most famous Catholic American cardinals who America has ever produced, uh, Cardinal Gibbons, or the Catholic Church has ever produced in America. Uh, and he wrote through his chancellor, uh, C.F. Thomas, in a letter November 11, 1895, Cardinal Gibbons said, of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change from Sabbath to Sunday was her act. And this act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. So essentially what the Roman church says is yes, the Bible says written with the finger of God that the seventh day is the Sabbath, but we changed it. And the fact that we had the authority to make that change is evidence that we have authority from God and that we are the true church. That's what they are essentially saying. It's a mark of our authority that we are the true church. Uh, when we're done this evening, when you leave on the table back there, we have a stack of these little books that I've written called The Truth About the Sabbath. And this little book, it's only a dollar. Uh, this book has every answer to this question you can possibly imagine. It goes into the Sabbath in the Old Testament, Sabbath in the New Testament, what Paul taught about the Sabbath, how do we know what day the Sabbath is, why the Sabbath isn't Jewish, uh, what Jesus said about the Sabbath, how he healed on the Sabbath, how the Sabbath was changed to Sunday, 
what Protestants say about the Sabbath, what Catholics say about the Sabbath, uh, the objections like we're not under the law, we're under grace, or uh, that no man uh, judge you according to this day or that day, Romans 14, Colossians 2, every verse you can even imagine that is being used to try to show that the seventh day doesn't apply to us today, all those questions are answered in this book. They're answered biblically, they're answered historically, they're answered from the lips of Jesus. I have studied this subject inside and out, upside and down, and I am totally convinced that the Ten Commandments still remain for us today because they were written with the finger of God very, very clearly. Now, we've already read in Revelation 13 that one of these days, the mark of the beast is going to be enforced by law. Now, if everything I'm telling you is true, which I just hope that you'll study this out for yourself, uh, if this is all true, if Sunday really is the mark of Rome's authority, and let me clarify, nobody has the mark of the beast right now. Nobody's got it. But the Bible says one of these days it's going to be enforced by law around the world. And when that time comes, people are going to have to make a final choice. And if at that point they choose to go along with the beast and to go along with his mark, then they get the mark in their forehead or in their hands. Uh, and if all of this is true, then what that means is that one of these days, there are going to be Sunday laws in America and around the world. Now, is that even remotely possible? Is it possible that in a, in a, in a country that still somewhat stands for religious freedom, that America could ever violate its principles of freedom and cross over the line and Congress enforcing the keeping of Sunday in America and it being followed around the world. Could that ever possibly happen? Well, let me share with you some information that's very, very current. Have you ever heard of the issue of climate change? I think we've all heard of climate change. There's hardly a disaster that happens anymore these days uh, that somebody doesn't say some news organization, this is because of climate change. This earthquake or that fire or that flood, apparently it's all because of climate change. Uh, the, the most vocal advocate for um, global action concerning climate change is guess who? It's Pope Francis. Pope Francis, that's right. And he wrote a document that came out uh, in June of 2015, and it's called Laudato Si. Uh, and you see the subtitle there is on the care of our common home. And this is Pope Francis's encyclical letter written to people all around the world, telling people everywhere what they need to do in order to solve the pollution and climate change problem. And at the heart of Laudato Si, his document, this is what he says. Section 237, June 18, 2015. You can Google us and find this anywhere. Uh, Pope Francis said, Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, now, first of all, uh, the Sabbath is not Jewish. The Pope needs to uh, correct himself on that. He's not correct. Sunday is not the Jewish Sabbath. It's the Lord's Sabbath. But he says Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. So essentially, he's saying that Sunday is the day that will help people all around the world come together it will help our relationships with God, with ourselves, and even with the world. Because imagine if every business around the world closed its doors on Sunday, and if Sunday laws took place all over the world, then think of all the less pollution that would be going up to the environment. And that would help with uh, global warming. Here's a picture of Pope Francis speaking before a joint session of the House of Congress, United States government, in September of 2015 amazing event. This was the first time ever that a pope was invited to speak before a joint session of the House of Congress. This never happened in the history of the world, in the history of America. Uh, he was invited by John Boehner, who's Catholic, and he invited him to come, and the pope spoke before a uh, packed audience. It was televised around the world, and in this address, Pope Francis told American lawmakers what they need to do in order to solve the climate change problem. 
and nine times in his speech, he referred to his document, Laudato Si. Nine times he referred to his encyclical. And inside that cycle, cyclical is the importance of keeping Sunday. Here's an article from the Associated Press. Keeping stores open on Sunday is not beneficial for society, says Pope Francis. Uh, here's an, uh, an article from a European publication called The Parliament that says Sunday work is a danger to our health and to our safety. Here's ABC News, German court enforces day of rest, referring to Sunday as a day of spiritual elevation. Here's Fox News, let's make Sunday a day of rest for God's sake. Uh, here's an article about North Dakota rejecting the uh, movement in North Dakota to get rid of those old blue laws. The blue laws are the old laws on the books that require businesses to close on Sunday. And people in North Dakota are saying, we got to change these old blue laws. And the uh, Senate got together and said, no, we are not going to change these laws. We need these laws. People need to get back to going to church on Sunday. Uh, CNN, here's an article. Uh, Sylvia Allen, a uh, senator uh, in Arizona, she said during a gun bill debate that we should be debating a bill to mandate the keeping of Sunday. So we see articles uh, in many different publications. Here's a Catholic publication called First Things, and it says, bring back the blue laws. And essentially what's happening is this. As the world is getting more wicked, as the climate is disintegrating, as immorality is growing, as all kinds of problems are taking place around the world, there is a growing movement. And the growing movement spearheaded by Pope Francis is that it, the way to solve the world's problems is if we all come back to God and if we go to church on Sunday. That's what he's saying. And that we need Sunday legislation because it will help the environment. It'll lessen pollution. It'll lessen global warming. It'll affect climate change. It'll lessen the amount of storms and fires and floods. It will strengthen the family. It's good for morality. It's good for everybody to come back to church on Sunday and for us to have laws to that effect. And let me ask you, now that you've been to this seminar and you're thinking about all these things, what is wrong with that reasoning? What is wrong with the idea of forcing people to go to church on the first day of the week around the world? What's wrong with it? Okay, that's right. Number one reason is it uses force. And the Lord never forces people, right? He gives people a free choice. You can go to church or not go to church. You can come to this meeting or not come to this meeting. You can pray or not pray. You can, be, uh, you can accept Jesus as your Savior or, or don't. Jesus never forced anybody to be his followers, his follower. He doesn't do that. He gives people free will. Okay, what else is wrong with Sunday laws? That's right. It's, uh, it's not according to the Ten Commandments. It's the wrong day. So God doesn't use force, and Sunday is not the right day. The Ten Commandments say, this, remember the seventh day, not the first day of the week. Another thing that's wrong with Sunday laws is that they, they go back to the Catholic Church. You can see Catholic, the Catholic Church has had Sunday laws all throughout European history. Another thing that's wrong with Sunday laws is that they are a violation of the Constitution of the United States of America. That the, the government, the Constitution says that Congress is never to make a law to establish religion or to prohibit the free exercise thereof. It's a violation of the principles of the lamb. And remember the prophecy says that the, with the, the nation with two horns like a lamb is eventually gonna speak like a dragon. It's gonna violate its own principles. And so Sunday is the wrong day. It uses force. It's against the Ten Commandments, and it's a violation of freedom of conscience, which is the heart and soul and DNA of the United States of America. And it goes back to the Catholic Church. So to me, those are some pretty significant reasons. 
And what's, what prophecy predicts is that we are heading toward a crisis. And we can all see that. It's not just America in crisis, but it's the world in crisis, isn't it? Our world is growing in its uh, crisis. And the Bible says one of these days, uh, the tip, we're going to reach the tip of the, the, the scales. And I don't know whether it's going to have to do with the debt crisis and the economy or the environment or morality or a combination of all of these, but eventually we're going to reach a tipping point and we're going to enter into a terrible crisis. And what prophecy predicts is that when this crisis hits, there's going to be a solution that's going to surface from the beast and from the second beast, and they're going to work together. And they're going to convince people that there is a solution that we all need to come back to God. And that sounds, I mean, that sounds right, doesn't it? We do need to come back to God, don't we? But somewhere in the mixture, there's going to be a fly in the ointment. And the fly is that uh, the solution to coming back to God is using force and forcing people to go to church on Sunday and to accept the mark of authority of the Roman Catholic Church. So it's going to be a false solution, and it's going to involve Sunday legislation. And we can see the buildup. It's not just what prophecy predicts. It's not just putting all the clues together, but we can also see the news reports from ABC, CNN, Fox News, NBC, Associated Press. We can see the rumbling, and we know we can see, it's like, the writing on the wall. We can see the writing on the wall. We know the direction that we're going. Uh, some time ago, I was in an airport, and uh, there was a man behind me waiting to go on to the, to get to the ticket counter, and he had this shirt on. And I looked at that shirt, and I thought, would you mind if I take a picture of that shirt so I could show it in my seminars? And he said, sure, no problem. Uh, so there it is. It's a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. And it says, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. And that's a great quote. That when the time comes when governments force us to do something that is morally wrong, that's contrary to religious freedom, there comes a time when we have to draw a line. There comes a time when we have to stand up and we have to say, no, I'm not going to do it. And when this time finally comes and the prophecy predicts that the mark of the beast is going to be enforced by law, what's going to happen is when that time finally comes, it's going to be the final hour in the history of the world. And at that time, the three angels' messages who have been growing, growing in power, and they're being given right now around the world, radio, television, satellite, internet, seminars, tracks, literature. These angels are growing and they are unstoppable. Satan cannot shoot them out of the sky. He can't do it. And uh, these messages are going to get louder and louder and louder. And they're finally going to tell people when the mark is enforced that this is not a good thing. This is not a solution to the world's problems. This is another problem on top of the problems. And this is actually a mark of Rome's authority. And it's going to tell people, it's going to urge people, it's going to call people to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The three angels' messages are going to get louder and louder and louder. And the Holy Spirit is going to be speaking through them to help people to make a choice. Now, I want to tell you something very, very, very important. And this, uh, I've been learning this. I just keep learning. I, I don't have all the answers. I'm still a learner, just like you are. But one day, it really hit me that the finger that wrote the Ten Commandments, the finger of God, was on a hand the same hand that was nailed to the cross. That it was the finger of Jesus that wrote the law that allowed himself then to be crucified on a cross. It's our maker who died on Calvary. 
And the ultimate issue of the mark of the beast has to do with Jesus. It has to do with our loyalty to our maker, that we follow him and we appreciate the cross and we want to love him and be obedient to him. And we don't want to follow, we don't want to follow the beast. Those are the issues. And at some point, everybody is going to have to make a choice between one way or the other way, just like the angels in heaven had to decide, are we following God or are we following Lucifer? Just like Adam and Eve had to decide, are we going to obey God and avoid the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and only eat from the tree of life? Or are we going to yield to the serpent and make that choice? In the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. At the end of the world, there's two days. Two days. And the issue really isn't the tree itself or the days uh, so much as it is who we're going to serve. That's really the ultimate issue is whose side are we on? Are we going to be on the side of the beast and his mark? Are we are going to be on the side of our maker who gave his life for us on the cross, who tells us to remember the seventh day Sabbath and to keep that day holy. Revelation 14, 12, to me, this is the bottom line. And many times when I get to this point in my seminar, I like to kind of disappear. So I'm gonna go back behind this wall here. So you're not gonna see me. <laughs> and I want you to look at the verse. The verse says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Ultimately, what you are learning is not from a little man behind this wall right what you're ultimately learning is the word of the lord this is god's word it's god's voice it's what god said and uh, 44 years ago i read these verses just like you're reading them now and i felt the call inside my soul that i'm going to be one of these people god is calling me to be a commandment keeper and to follow jesus christ my savior and i made that choice and uh, around the world what's happening right now is god is developing this people he's developing them he's growing this group and they're growing from every nation tribe tongue and people many different denominations many different churches are hearing these messages and they're saying i want to be part of this i want to be part of what god is doing in these last days and prophecy tells us that when this group is fully formed, his loyal people, loyal to Jesus, that when the three angels' messages are done, what happens? He comes. The verse says, I looked and behold, a white cloud. Jesus is coming down for the people who have chosen to be loyal to him during the final crisis. That's what, that's what prophecy is predicting. Uh, I'm convinced that if we're loyal to Jesus, he'll be loyal to us. If we stick with him, he'll stick with us. And even though every earthly support is cut off and we can't buy or sell, unless we go along with the mark of the beast, God is going to take care of his people. He's going to bring us through. He's going to bring people from around the world, from many churches. They're going to hear the call. And those who hold on are going to go through all the way to the end. It's going to be a combined group from many different people, from many different churches, Catholic churches, Protestant churches, all kinds of churches. Uh, and they are all going to unite as a people who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And they are the people that Jesus will bring through to the great day when he appears in the clouds with power and glory to come down and to gather us and to take us to a better land. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I want to be part of that people. I believe this is my last slide. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. Jesus is our maker. He wrote the Ten Commandments with his own thinker. Uh, I have a friend of mine that actually is dead now. He used to be a Lutheran pastor. Pastor Raymond Holmes, he died in his 90s. He used to pastor a big church uh, in Ironwood, Ironwood, Michigan, a large Lutheran church. 
And his wife, Shirley, made friends with a Seventh-day Adventist, and they started studying the Bible. And his wife learned that the seventh day is really the, the Bible Sabbath. And so she went home and told her husband, honey, the seventh day is really the Sabbath. And Pastor Holmes uh, went through the roof, and he almost divorced his wife. But the Lord impressed him, don't do that. Honor my covenant. You made a covenant between God and, uh, and your wife in my sight, and I want you to honor your covenant. So Dr. Holmes thought, thought to himself, all right, I'm going to study, I'm going to go to a Seventh-day Adventist uh, seminary, and I'm going to study and I'm going to prove her wrong. So, so he went to Andrews University in Michigan to the seminary, and he studied all the history books, the Bible, uh, the New Testament, the writings of Paul, and he finally discovered, lo and behold, he couldn't believe it, that his wife was actually right. Just like the disciples, you know, the disciples, uh, the women said, he's been raised from the dead. And they said, no, he can't be, you can't be right. And then they went to the tomb and they finally found out, sure enough, the women were right. Jesus was, has been resurrected. <laughs> like that, ladies? And so Pastor Holmes uh, finally decided to keep the seventh day Sabbath and uh, became a minister of the Adventist church and uh, was a good personal friend of mine until he died in his 90s. He wrote a book, you can find it online, called Stranger in My Home, about his wife and his struggle to, uh, over the issue of the Sabbath. I'd like to ask the ushers if they would pass out the card. We're down at the end here. Will the ushers pass out the card? I want to just go over this with you quickly, and then we're going to have our ladies sing our song. Uh, we'll have the, uh, the rap after that. We'll have our Q&A. And uh, hopefully we can all fill this out. I know some of you, you, you may need to think about this. You may need to pray and study, and I understand that completely. But this is called My Decision for Jesus. If you need a pencil, the ushers also have extra pencils. So if they could just pass these out. Uh, it's called My Decision for Jesus. And the first one there says, I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Hopefully we can all do that, whatever church we're from, that we want Jesus to be the Lord of our lives. Number two is I want to be ready for his soon return. Hopefully we can all make that choice. Uh, number three, by his grace, I want to be among those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. I know this is a, a big commitment, but God is calling us to be part of this people. And whether you're ready for that or not yet, it's up to you. Uh, God knows your heart and your life. Uh, now the next one says, I choose to keep the seven day Sabbath. Now my dad was a Presbyterian till he died, but he still chose to keep the Sabbath, keep the seventh day Sabbath. God was leading him step by step. And if you're ready to make that choice, you can, you can check that, or maybe you still need to study more. Uh, number five is pray for me. We all need prayer. I need prayer. You need prayer. Number, uh, the last one is I want to learn more, uh, which the pastor will share, share in a little bit what the next, uh, next study on the book of Daniel is available. If you'd like to uh, join that class. You can put your name and address on here. On the back, you can put prayer requests. And as you are looking at this card and filling this out, I'd like to ask the ladies to come up and sing the closing song. And as you look at this slide, as you think about Jesus and what he did for us, now may God help you to make a decision to follow Jesus wherever he leads, no matter what.
Thank you very much. Uh, will the ushers uh, collect the cards? If you can take your cards and just pass them to any of the aisles, pass them this direction or that direction to the aisles, and then the ushers can walk up and down the aisles and pick up the cards. Uh, before we have prayer, and before we do our Q&A, which is next, I'd like to invite the pastor up to just let people know uh, what's coming. If you'd like to study the Bible, more, learn more from Daniel, book of Daniel. After I'm gone, I'm not staying, I have to go. <laughs> so Pastor Berger, we will see just what let people know what's that. coming. Right. So, yeah. You know, we heard about the book of Revelation. Jesus is the center of the book of Revelation. Uh, there's another book in the Old Testament where Jesus also is the center. And that's the book of Daniel. And many people don't think about that. They don't realize Christ is the center of that book. And there are some amazing prophecies in the book of Daniel that, well, even more amazing than what we've heard here. Um, and I'm going to be starting not this Monday, but next Monday at 6.30 p.m., a uh, six-week seminar meeting twice per week, Monday and Friday at 6.30 p.m. And it's called Unlocking Prophecy, the Book of Daniel, an interactive Bible study, chapter by chapter, six weeks, six weeks. Ready for deep sea diving, all right? Um, so you will get this on the way out. Um, when you go out the door, you will get this. It has room for your name, your phone number, and your email address. No address, just name, phone number, email address. Uh, starting June 5, right here, six weeks, three study guides that you can take with you home. And uh, we will have Q&As like he will have right now. Lots of possibility for interactive Bible study. Uh, you will also be able to uh, receive a Bible if you don't have one, but it's going to be either a New King James or a King James Version, your preference, or you can bring your own. Um, we can study of these teachings from any Bible, even the, even the Roman Catholic Bible, um, and uh, any kind of Bible, uh, because you compare Scripture with Scripture, and it's like putting a puzzle together to discover the beautiful gems that have been lost sight of sadly uh, to uh, a lot of neglect in uh, among us as christians through the centuries so i look forward to that i hope you will be part of that again just to fill it out and leave it um give it to me personally or just leave it at the table out there put it in uh, put it in the the basket when you're done that you want to be part of this class again june 5. thank you okay, thank you very much uh, when you leave, we're going to give you a free book, another book called Decoding the Mark of the Beast. Uh, we also have a table in the back there full of White Horse Media material. I have a book on 666, which is only a couple dollars, but it's very informative. Another book on the Bloody Woman and the Seven-Headed Beast about Revelation 17. We have this little book uh, about the Seventh-day Sabbath. We have a stack of those back there, plus some little pocket books and some other free material. We hope you'll check that out. Um, so why don't we pray, close the meeting, and then we have a microphone. If you have to leave, I understand it's late, but I'm happy to answer your questions, so we'll have our Q&A. So let's bow our heads and let's pray and thank the Lord for everything he's done for us. Uh, dear Father, dear God, as always when I do these meetings, again, I sense the presence of the Holy Spirit I know that Jesus has been with me and that I have been, to the best of my ability, a faithful teacher of the Bible. 
And I just pray for everybody here that you will guide their minds. Many of them are, many people have heard new things tonight. And uh, it's, it may be a struggle, but I just pray that you will guide them, guide your children, lead them step by step as they learn more light from your word and give us strength to follow you no matter what. Thank you for this weekend, for everybody that's here. Lord, may we all meet together uh, again someday, especially in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.